So glad to see a full house here this morning. So glad that you chose to be in worship on this Resurrection Sunday. As I was preparing for today, I'm just looking through the Scriptures here that we're going to look at and just doing a little bit of research. I came across a, a blog site where they asked this question. Did Jesus really resurrect from the dead? Or is it just some hoax to make Him look like a God? And people responded to that blog. I want to share two of those responses with you here this morning. One person wrote, Did any historian of the day, of the time of Jesus, record it? No. To me, that means it never happened. And trust me, the news that somebody rose from the dead after being crucified would have gone round the empire like wildfire. I would look to that person and say, you know, if you're not going to read the Bible, read Josephus. He was a historian who wrote about the resurrection of Jesus. So there there was a historian. But but this one is the one that that really took me back. Just like the rest of the New Testament, the four Gospels were written in Greek and were written decades after the alleged event. Mark probably dates around A.D. 66 to 70. Matthew and Luke around A.D. 85, 90. And John, A.D. 90 to 110. Jesus and His disciples did not understand Greek and primarily spoke Aramaic. This is generally agreed upon by historians. Despite all traditional description, all four Gospels are anonymous, and most scholars agree that none were written by eyewitnesses. A few conservative scholars defend the traditional description of attributions, but for a variety of reasons, the majority of scholars have abandoned that view. So a credible answer to your question is, we do not know if Jesus was resurrected. And they go on to say, for those that say they know that Jesus was resurrected, I would ask, were you there? Knowing something and believing something are two completely different matters. Only 31.2% of the world identify as Christian. So a good question may be, what does the other 68.8% of the world population know? Scientifically speaking, Jesus' resurrection is implausible. Those are words from just two people. But I ask you this morning, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Amen. I want you to think about that answer. We all agree that He did, but do we realize the implications of our belief in the resurrection? You see, how you choose to answer that question not only sets the course for your eternity, but it also, or it ought, to impact the day-to-day operations of your life. So let me ask you another question. As Resurrection Sunday becomes so mundane and routine for you that it has really become nothing more than just a normal Sunday. See, if Resurrection Sunday really means what it ought to mean, then every Sunday should be Resurrection Sunday. And it should be more than a mundane and routine But I can't help but wonder, for those of us who believe in the resurrection, that we are in danger of losing the significance of Resurrection Sunday. Because we've allowed the routine and the mundane to characterize how we approach not just Sunday. But does the resurrection only impact you on Sunday? Or does it impact you on Monday? Does it impact you on Tuesday? How about Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? Is the resurrection only for one day of the week? One day of the year? Or does the resurrection impact us on every single day of the year? See, I think we are in danger of losing sight of the power of the resurrection because we allow the mundane and the routine to characterize our life that that we lose sight of what it really means that we serve a risen Savior. So when you come to church on Sunday, is it just another day? Is it just another activity to do? Just another obligation to check off my list? 
And so this morning, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I want to ask this question as we get started. Does your belief in the resurrection really matter? Does your belief in the resurrection really matter? Now, I want to give you some, some background to 1 Corinthians 15. We know this is the great resurrection chapter. All right? And at the very outset of chapter 15, Paul presents the gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day. That, that's, that encapsulates the gospel. But 1 Corinthians 15 is not just about the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 is also about the resurrection of all people. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever. And that's nothing new to either Jews or the church. It's taught in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, one of the earliest books of the Old Testament is the book of Job. And Job says in chapter 19, verse 26, he says, Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. He's talking about a resurrection. And Jesus says this in John chapter 5. He says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to the resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. See, there, there it is. There's a resurrection of both believers and unbeliever. Every human being will be resurrected. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is about. But he continues in John 6.44, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sends, sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. But then I love John 11.25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. So Jesus promises both a physical resurrection and an eternal resurrection resurrection to the believer and unbeliever alike so you will either be raised to a glorious future or you will be raised for judgment when well, the apostles would continue to teach this resurrection of all people and in fact it got them in trouble in the book of acts chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 we see this as they were speaking to the people the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the sadducees came up to them being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. This group known as the Sadducees, they did not believe in the resurrection. That is why they are so sad, you see. It'll sink in eventually. Okay, I know. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, there it comes. All right. That, that, there was a group of people who did not believe in the resurrection. And, and so they taught that the body and, and the spirit, they're two separate things. The body will die and it will forever stay in the grave. But there is the soul that is immortal. Paul would continue to teach the importance of the resurrection. It's an important part of his message of the gospel. You can see that throughout his letters. But in spite of all of the, the scriptures, in spite of Jesus saying there would be a resurrection in spite of the apostles and in spite of Paul telling these Corinthian believers there is going to be a resurrection, they bought into the Greek philosophy of the day that said, no, that's not possible. It only applied to the spiritual realm, not the physical. And so Paul addresses this problem. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. He says, if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? There's the problem. And there's something very important about verse 12 that, that we don't see in the English, but in the Greek it's written this way. It's a, here's a literal translation. There's no article in front of the word dead. So here's how it reads. How say some of you there is no resurrection of corpses? That's a physical body. Physical resurrection. So all throughout 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is laying out this argument of the reality of the resurrection. Not just Jesus' resurrection, but the resurrection of all people. See, you can't say you believe in the resurrection of Jesus without also believing that there's a resurrection of all people. You can't just take parts of the Gospel and keep it. 
and say, I like this one, but I don't like this part. And no, you either accept it all or you don't accept it at a, any part of it. But there's also a part of the gospel that says if you reject, then your eternity is a separation from God. So if you, if, if you accept the gospel, then you are going to be raised to a glorious life. But if you reject the gospel, then you are going to be raised to a life of eternal separation from God. Guaranteed fact. And so what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15 is he connects the resurrection of Jesus to the resurrection of all people. And so there are some serious implications. We're not going to look at all of 1 Corinthians 15. We're just going to focus on verses 12 to 19 because in this particular section, Paul lays out the argument, what if Jesus weren't raised? And there are some great implications to our life on a daily basis that if Jesus wasn't raised, how does that impact us? And so we want to walk through this and really think about, you know, do we really believe in the resurrection? Because if we believe, then there, there are some things that ought to move us. There are some things that ought to challenge us. So let's examine it. First of all, there are some theological consequences. There are some theological consequences. Starting in verse 12, let's go down through verse 16. Now, if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised and our preaching is vain, your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that He raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. See, what didn't make sense to Paul was the fact that the Corinthian believers, they already accepted the fact that Jesus rose again. That's part of the gospel. They accepted that. But now they're buying into this philosophy that dead men don't rise. And he says, that doesn't make sense. But if you're going to believe that, then he says, here's, here's the result. If you're going to carry that out to its fullest extent, Here's what you need to think about. All right? So theological consequence number one. If dead men don't rise, Jesus is not raised. Why is that true? Because Jesus was also a man. He's 100% man and 100% God. He's the only person who is 200% of something. Okay? No one else can claim that. He is 100% God, 100% man. If you don't believe in a physical resurrection of the body, then Jesus cannot be alive. All throughout the Gospels, especially the book of Luke, you see them focusing on either the deity or the humanity. Luke really focuses on his humanity. Remember, what's Luke's background? He's a doctor. So when you read the book of Luke, you're going to find a lot of things that point to his humanity. When Jesus came out of the tomb... He was still a man. What did Jesus tell Doubting Thomas? Reach out and touch me. See my hands. See my feet. And then, to provide even more, He said, give me something to eat. If it was just this apparition, then why would He say, give me food? If you're going to say that dead men don't rise, then Jesus is still a man dead which goes against what you claim to believe in the gospel romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth jesus as lord and believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved it doesn't get any clearer than that let's pause for a moment just think about this from a practical standpoint The truth is we serve a risen Savior and we believe in the resurrection of all people at some point in time, but what evidences are there to prove you believe that? In other words, if you've accepted the truth of the Gospel, then everything about you ought to be different. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. That could not be possible if Jesus was still dead. And so I ask you, what is new in your life? What has He made new? What areas of your life can you point to that that says, this is the way I was, 
But now, because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, I have a new life. I am a new person. What can you point to? So I ask you again, has Sunday simply become an ordinary day? See, if we truly believe in the resurrection, then every time we gather, not just Sunday, we gather Sunday for particular reasons, but every time we're together, every time we're out there, well, it's a bunch of new creations getting together. A bunch of new creations getting together. And, and you know, let, let me be honest. You know, being, being up here preaching and up here on the praise team, sometimes I look out and I say, do you really believe in the resurrection? The reason why I say that is because some of you look like you just soured a couple dozen lemons. Is there joy in your heart because Jesus is alive? Amen. So why are we letting the influences of the world crush us? We serve a risen Savior. He has conquered death. He's conquered sin. He's made us new. This world doesn't have a hold on us. And we can rejoice evermore. Is there evidence that you are a new creation? Let's let the power of the resurrection communicate it to your face, right? What goes on in our heart, we need to communicate to our face. Or is what's going on in your heart turmoil? Is what's going on in your heart discouragement, defeat? You serve a risen Savior, then there ought to be joy in your heart because you are a new creation. So the resurrection really means what it ought to mean, then every day that we're together, every time we are together is a time to rejoice because we have a risen Savior. Amen? Theological consequence number two, all preaching is useless. And if Christ has not been raised, verse 14, then our preaching is vain. The Gospel doesn't exist if Christ isn't raised. If He doesn't rise, everything is lost. If He does, everything is gained. Keep your finger here and turn to Romans chapter 1 real quickly. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. We need to see something very clear here that, that Paul sets out in, in the writing of this book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 down to verse 4. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called in this, as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God which He promised beforehand through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning His Son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to what? The flesh. Then verse 4, who was declared the Son of God with power by what? The resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 3 proves He's human. The flesh, David. He's after the lineage of David. Verse 4 proves His deity. He is the, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by what? The resurrection from the dead. So why do we gather here? See, if His deity is proven by the re resurrection, then if He's not, then we're just worshiping a man. But because He rose again, it proves He is God. And because He is God, He gives us our marching orders. He has the right to tell us how we are to live. The church belongs to Him. We receive our marching orders from the Scriptures. And so we gather every Sunday to, to study the Scriptures, to receive our marching orders, to correct the ways that we are going that don't measure up to His Word, that on a day-by-day -day basis, we are following our leader of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 1.18, He says that He was, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Meaning, He has the authority. He has the right to tell us what to do. But the gospel is gone if none of that is true. If Jesus isn't raised, there is no good news. There is no need for preaching. We might as well just all go home. right? Let's just go home. Why are we here? 
There's no need. If we're not going to preach about Jesus Christ, then what are we going to preach about? We can't, and, and let me tell you, there are some churches that are doing something else, right? But here at Open Door, we're going to focus on what the Word says. We're going to focus on lifting up our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the one who died for us. He is risen again, and so we can follow Him. We follow His lead. It's not the elders. You don't follow the elders. You're following Christ as we follow Christ. Right? Open Door Bible Church is not your church. It's Christ's church. It belongs to Him. And so we follow Him. But none of that is true if Jesus isn't alive. Gospel preaching would then be fake news. Be a hoax. Jesus isn't alive and He didn't conquer death. He didn't conquer sin. And He didn't conquer hell. Friends, if that is true, I can't think of any worse news. Theological consequence number three. Your faith is worthless. If Christ has not been raised and our preaching is in vain, your faith also is in vain. And he repeats it again in verse 17. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Empty. Useless. If the Gospel is not real, then you're putting your faith in something that is useless. We believed something that didn't happen. If dead men don't rise, then He didn't rise. And if He didn't rise, then everything we're doing now is a bunch of hooey. The Bible is a bunch of hooey. Everything you're doing is a bunch of hooey if Jesus Christ didn't raise from the dead. So please... Don't hear me say, and some of you may listen to this message later and, and maybe you pick up and say that you know, the Bible is a bunch of hooey. Please make sure you understand I'm not saying the Bible is a bunch of hooey. All right? But there are people out there who do. Think of all the Old Testament people. People like Abel, Noah, Abraham, Moses. Noah was probably... If none of this is true, Noah was probably the worst fool of them all. He spent 120 years building a stupid boat. If it's all worthless. To believe in a God who couldn't save him from his own sins. Might as well just rip Hebrews 11 out of our Bibles. Their faith was empty because God was not able to save them. God was not able to pull off what He planned. He was powerless. If Jesus isn't raised, if God didn't raise Him from the dead, then God is powerless to do anything else. Think of all the countless missionaries across the world. Some who have given their lives for the very Gospel message. That's a life wasted if none of this is true. Why go through the pain and suffering of living in a world that hates you if none of this is true? Because your faith in God is misplaced if Jesus didn't rise. Theological consequence number four. We're all a bunch of liars. That's what he says. Please, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just teaching what God says right here. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 15, he says, Moreover, we, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. The word false witness means outright deceiving liars. The resurrection, we're not real, then we're all just perpetuating a lie. We're frauds. We're telling people that God raised Jesus from the dead. We're giving the world a false testimony if Jesus Christ isn't alive. See, to be one of the apostles, you had to have seen the risen Savior. That was a requirement. All of them said they were eyewitnesses. So if Jesus didn't rise again, then they're liars too. And guess what? We followed the apostles' message, haven't we? We followed what they've taught. If you've accepted the gospel, you bought into the lie, and you're and you just keep perpetuating it. So you just better stop telling your kids, stop telling your family, stop lying to your co-workers. You might as well just stop lying. If Jesus isn't alive, then stop it. Making the apostles liars. But even more, 
Did you make Jesus a liar? Because in John 16, Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit who will guide us into truth. And if Jesus is not raised because dead men can't be raised, then Jesus lied. The Holy Spirit's not guiding us in truth. If what this is is a lie, if Jesus isn't alive, if He were still dead and buried in the grave somewhere, that would mean that death got the last word. Consider Hebrews 2.14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death He might render powerless Him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Do you see the significance of the resurrection? If Jesus were still dead, then Satan won. What would this world be like if Satan won? See, our whole theological system disintegrates if Jesus isn't alive. If dead men can't be raised, then everything we believe is worthless. If the resurrection means what it ought to mean, then we ought to be convinced everyone needs to hear this message. What evidence exists to show you're convinced everyone needs to hear? What bridges are you building into the lives of others to talk about your risen Savior? How much of your time, talents, and treasures are you committing to growing in your faith? To go deeper, to contribute to the spiritual life of the church so that we can continue to grow and be uh, witnesses for Him. What habit patterns reveal you serve a risen Savior? See, that they're far-reaching. And I'm just scratching the surface here. There are far-reaching implications. As if the devastation to our theology is not enough, there are also some very personal consequences. Starting in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Personal consequences. Personal consequence number one, you have to atone for your own sin. That's what he says. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. Romans 4.25 says He was delivered over because of our transgression and was raised because of our justification. Justification is God looking at us and in Christ declaring us righteous. Not because of anything we can do or not because of anything we have done, but only because of Christ. Because of the resurrection, your forgiveness has been secured. Sins past present, and future. They're all covered under the blood of Christ. He paid for our sins with His own life. So if you believe that the resurrection didn't happen, then justification can't happen. There is no forgiveness. There's no deliverance from sin. If Jesus were not raised, then you would have to atone for your own sin. And what's the payment for that? For the wages of sin is what? Death. So the only way you can atone for your own sins is to die. But guess what? Your death is meaningless. Because there's nothing you and I can do to ever earn our way to heaven. If there's no resurrection, Jesus didn't conquer sin. It conquered Him. It killed Him. He stayed dead. There's no forgiveness. No justification. No salvation. It's all on you to figure out how you're going to atone for your sin. And all I can say to you is good luck with that. See, if the resurrection means what it ought to mean, then we ought to continually praise God because we don't have to worry about atoning for our sins. It's taken care of. Why? Because Jesus is alive. We're found in Him. God justified us by His grace alone. Personal consequence number two. No hope to be reunited with those who have gone before us Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If Jesus isn't resurrected, then Peter, James, John, Paul, all of them are in eternal torment. Guys like Luther, Calvin, Moody, Charles Stanley, you name those guys who who you followed for long periods of time, who are now dead and gone. 
How about your grandmother, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your spouses, your children? All who love Jesus are in hell, eternally separated from God if Jesus isn't alive. That's what he's saying. There's no hope for us to ever see them again if Jesus isn't alive. Satan won. God lost if Jesus isn't alive. See, if the dead don't rise, Christ isn't isn't risen. Preaching is useless. Faith is empty. Apostles are liars. Sin is unforgiven. Dead believers are eternally lost. Do we see the implications of the resurrection? But because He was raised, you and I have a sure hope and a guaranteed hope that we will one day see those who have gone before us. Personal consequence number three, all believers are the dumbest fools. That's what He says. Look at verse 19. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. If we put all our eggs in one basket, then Christians are the most pitiful people in all the world. How stupid can we be, right? Think about it. Fighting against temptation, struggling with sin, seeking to please Christ, obeying the Scripture. Having Bible studies, gathering every week, bearing our crosses, suffering reproach, trying to witness to people who don't want to hear. All of those things would be pretty stupid if Jesus Christ wasn't alive. Why would we do it? But, we know He is alive. We know and He fills us with joy. And so we can go through those sufferings. Not because they're fun, but because we know on the other side of our suffering, we have a far greater eternal weight of glory. Why? Because we serve a risen Savior. The Corinthians were people who lost sight of the resurrection. Paul wrote to tell them there's power in the resurrection. And he even wrote to the people in Philippi, I love Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. Every single believer has the power of resurrection dwelling inside you. Think about that. So why are we powerless? It's not because God hasn't equipped us with the power. It's because we've disconnected ourselves from the power. The resurrection has lost significance in our mind, in our heart. So a lesson for life here this morning is does the resurrection mean what it ought to mean to you? You're here without Christ. I implore you today, the Scripture is very clear that if you are not found in Christ, you will spend an eternity separated from God. And the only resurrection you're going to experience is a resurrection into judgment. But you can solve that today by coming to Jesus Christ. Coming today and and bowing before Him, acknowledging Him as your Lord and Savior. But believer, you're a new creation. You're a new creation. I mentioned it before, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. And so what that does then is is there ought to be a growing love for God. You ought to have a growing love for God because you're thankful for His grace and forgiveness. Are you thankful for grace? Are you thankful for forgiveness? You have a growing confidence that sinful habits can be handled. You recognize that because Jesus rose again, you don't have to continue living the way you used to. You can change. Because you have the power of the resurrection dwelling in you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You have a growing desire for personal holiness. It's no longer an, oh, oops, I sinned. It's, oh, no, I've sinned. So you find ways in which you can be growing and changing to to put on holiness, to recognize that, that God commanded us to be holy, and God never commands us to do something He doesn't empower us to do. He says, be holy, for I am holy. Holiness is possible. See, the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection has liberated you from enslavement to sin. You don't have to be shackled to it. It's made your faith useful. 
It secured your hope and guaranteed a glorious future. It provided an everlasting joy. And if the resurrection means what it ought to mean, then every day you can live out the truth of 1 Corinthians 15.58. I'm going to put it up here on the screen, but you can see it in your version as well. What is the truth of 1 Corinthians 15.58? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. We can only do that because Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. So does the resurrection matter? Yes, it matters. Your life today and where you spend eternity is determined by what you believe about the resurrection. Let's let today be a day that starts our path where it should be going. Let's tap into that power of the resurrection. And let's let every day be evident of our belief in the resurrection. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank You. We serve a risen Savior. And God, you have, You've raised Jesus Christ to new life so that we could be raised to new life. God, I pray for all of us here this morning. Pray for those that do not know You. That on, on this Sunday that they have chosen to come and to worship here, that they will have heard the message of Jesus Christ. Dying, being buried, and rose again to secure our salvation. And that there's no other way in which we can be saved but through Jesus Christ alone. I pray that today would be the day. For the rest of us, Lord, I pray that we would not lose sight of the resurrection. That every day we recognize the power of the resurrection lives within us and we can live a victorious life. because. Jesus is alive forevermore. It's in His wonderful name we pray. Amen.